Okay. Since today is the last day, we're not gonna go over anything new. We're gonna review what we did over these past weeks. But first, before we do that, let's go over today's homework. Today, we covered trigonometry, right? So yeah, let's go over it. Um, special angles, that's something important. So let's do one example. Let's try cos of um, 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3 and sine of 2 pi over 3. We need to solve for what these are. Um, was anyone able to solve this one? Any answer? Nobody? I solved it. Okay, what did you get for cos and sine? Yeah. Oh, for cos, I got negative 0 0.5. Negative 0 0.5. And for sin, I wasn't sure, but I got like 0 0.87. 0 0.87, okay. I think that's right. 0 0.866. Yeah, 0 0.87 is right. But okay, let's let's go over this one really quickly, because um, when we write these answers, we usually don't like working with decimals. Decimals are not wrong, but we want to keep it as pure as possible, as accurate as possible. So as fractions, so 0 0.87 is the same thing as um, square root of three over two. So we wanna write it as square root of three over two and negative half. We usually don't represent it with decimals, but they're correct as well. They are the same thing. So let's go over this, two pi over three, where is that? Well, this is pi over two, right? This is pi over two, this is pi. So two pi over three is somewhere around here, right here. And if this is pi over two, that means this is going to be about pi over six, right? In other words, in what do you call it? In degree form, this is gonna be around 30 degrees. I'm just gonna write 30 degrees. So you create a right triangle like that. That's a right triangle, right angle. And if this is 30 degrees and this is 90 degrees, in this degree, since a triangle has to be 180 degrees, 30 degrees plus 90 degrees plus something degrees, I'll write x, means that x degrees has to be 90 plus 30 is 120. 120 degrees, 180 minus 120 is going to be 60 degrees. So this missing piece has to be 60 degrees. So we're trying to find this point, right? This x, y point, which is this distance, and this distance. So the sides of the right triangle, well, we know that the hypotenuse is one. And if we look at this, this is a what, 30, 60, 90 triangle. 30, 60, 90 triangle. We know that in a 30, 60, 90 triangle, we know that, what do we know? Well, if this is 30 degrees, let's say this is 60 degrees. We know that this is 2x, this is x, and this is x times square root of three. Okay, in this case, what is x? In this case, 
the one opposite of 30 degrees is x, right? So let's see. This is 30 degrees. What is this? Well, 2x is the hypotenuse, which is 1. 2x is 1. So x must be 0 0.5. So x must be, this distance right here must be 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 is x. So we can easily solve for this, right? It's just 0 0.5 times square root of 3. Or in other words, it's half times square root of 3. Half times square root of 3. So we found out what this distance is. That's square root of 3 over 2, or half times square root of 3. And this is half. And now, since it's in the second quadrant, in this quad, that means x has to be negative, right? It's on the left of the y-axis. So our point there is negative half and square root of 3 over 2. So this is going to be negative half, and sine is going to be square root of 3 over 2. Good job. Um, let's move on to the graphs of these trigonometric functions. So the first thing we covered last time is midline. So let's do that. Midline. So let's see. Mm, let's, let's do the equation part because the graphing part is quite easy. So if we're given an equation h of x is negative 4 sine of x minus pi over 4, what is our midline? Anyone, what is our midline in this equation? Is it 0? Zero? 0, right? Midline, remember, is the plus k, and we don't have anything right here. It's plus zero. So plus, I mean, so zero for the midline is correct. Let's move on quickly, since I think this part was easy. Let's go straight with amplitude. Amplitude, let's say we're given y equals five sine four x minus two minus three. What's our amplitude in this case? Five. Five, right? Amplitude is A. So if it's A times sine of thing. In this case, A is five, so five is our amplitude. Let's move on really quickly to our period. Let's try f of x equals three sine of 2x minus 1 plus 4. And can anyone tell me the period for this one? This one's a bit tricky. What is the period for this one? Nobody? OK. Well, if we look at our equation, period is b, where y equals a times sine b of x minus h plus k, right? Where these are all variables. But in this case, it's b. But do we have a b here? We, we don't, right? So if we don't have a b there, we have to create a b. So we can what we can factor a two out since it needs to be in the x form, not a two x form. So if we factor a two out, we get this, don't we? X minus half. We're dividing the whole thing by two. So now we have a b, but b isn't our period. Our period is two pi over b, right? So in this case, b is 2. So our period is just 2 pi over 2. Or in other words, 
which is pi. Let's move on straight to equations of sinusoidal functions. The graph of a sinusoidal function has a minimum point at 0, 2. Wait, let me erase this. So minimum point at 0, 2. Let's write that down. And has a maximum point at 3 pi and 6. Write the formula of the function where x is entered in radians. Did anyone get an equation for this one? Was anyone able to solve for an equation? But it? Okay. Well, let's let's plot the points first. So zero two is going to be somewhere here. If that's 2, that's 0, 0. 3 pi, 6. So let's see. 1, 2, 3. 3 pi, 6 is what? Somewhere around 1, 2. 6 is here. Oh, this is really bad. I'm going to not draw it to scale then. Let's just draw it. Roughly 3 pi 6 is going to be somewhere here. And that's going to be 6. And let's say that is 3 pi. So this is our minimum point. Our minimum point. So the graph never goes below this. The graph never goes above this, which is our maximum point. So it's going to look something like this, right? Where the maximum point touches this point. So what, what do we know from this? Well, we know two things, the amplitude and the midline. What's the amplitude? Well, the amplitude is the length from the midline to the maximum or minimum, right? In this case, our midline is four. So let's do that first. It's four because it's between two and six, right? And our amplitude from 4 to 6 or from 4 to 2, it's going to be 2. OK, what else can we find out? We also need to know um, period. We need to know period. And we also need to know um, phase drift. But Phase drift is the least important because we started at 0, 2. So if we regard it as a sine function, which always starts at the origin, then we don't really need a phase shift. So let's search for period. So from the minimum point to the maximum point, so it might be from here to here, it might be from here to here. But we know that it reached 3 pi over 6, so it reached. 0.6. It took 3 pi, 3 pi seconds or 3 pi time for it to reach the maximum point. So let's see what one period is. One period is going to be up and down. So um, yeah, here. This one loop is going to be one period, right? And this repeats like that. And it repeats again and again. So if it reaches a maximum, it's, it's going to be 1.5 or 0 0.5 or 2.5. It's never going to be exactly one period because this is drawn wrong. Let's say this is 3 pi. This is 3 pi. If this is one period, this is two periods. And this is 2.5, right? So knowing that, let's let's say it's 1.5 periods, 1.5 period. So if the period is 1.5, and it took what three pi radians for it to travel 1.5 period to travel a period of 1.5, and we want to know a period of one, right? Just one length of a period, and we can divide by 1.5 which gives us x, which is 
the same thing as 1x, right? Which is one period. So if we divide that, then it's going to be 2 pi. So our period is just going to be normal. It's a period of 2 pi. And we have every bit of information now. Y equals A times sine B X minus H plus K. Let's plug it in. A is our amplitude, so 2 sine B is our period, but B is not our period. 2 pi is our period. And if we want to know what B is, wait, this is done. Yeah. B is going to be 1, according to this equation. B is 1, because 2 pi is our period. And B has to be 1 for us to have a period of 2 pi, right? So we don't write anything for B. We don't have a phase shift. And our midline is going to be 4. So that's our equation for this um, graph. Let's move on. Do you guys have any other questions on the homework? Anything that was confusing that we should go over? Or we can start our review right now. OK. I guess you guys did OK on the homework. Let's start on the review. Let's go all the way back to day one where we did polynomial arithmetic. So for every day, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna say something that you should take away from this lesson from each day, the most important thing that you should remember, even though you forget everything else. So if you remember what polynomial arithmetic is, we did average rate of change average rate of change where we said fb minus f of a is b minus a, right? And this is the same thing as a slope. Right? If we have a graph like this, it's the same thing as the slope of a line. But the most important thing from this lesson is special products and just um, multiplying in general, foiling. So we went over special products, which is a squared minus b squared. This is the same thing as a plus b minus a minus b. We also went over plus b squared is what? a squared plus 2ab plus b squared and a minus b squared is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, right? This is what you should remember from this whole lesson. So if we have, let's say, 7a cubed minus 1 squared, if we have that, boom, this, is, this should already come into your mind that this is a special product. We can use one of these three equations to solve for this. Or you can just you can just factor, write it all out, 70 cubed minus 1. You can foil it. There's two methods. You write it out like this, and you start foiling. Foiling is front. 70 cubed times 70 cubed is going to be 49a to the 6. Front, outside, outside, right here, right? These two, negative 1 times 70 cubed is negative 70 cubed. Inside, is it going to be negative 1 times 7 cubed, which is negative 7 cubed once again. And last, which is negative 1 times negative 1, so positive 1. So if you simplify this, you get, you get 49a to the 6th power minus 14a cubed plus 1, right? That's one, that's one way to solve this. But another way is just to use this equation. Let's see, we have a minus sign here, and we have a squared on the outside. What does this mean? This follows this format, right? A minus b squared 
equals a squared minus jv plus b squared. What is a in this case? a is going to be 7a cubed, right? This digit. And what's b? b is just going to be 1. So if we just plug in everything into this equation, it's 7a cubed squared minus 2 7a cubed and 1 plus 1 squared. And we simplify. 7a cubed to the second power is going to be 49a to the sixth. Minus 2 times 7a cubed is negative 14a cubed. Plus times 1 is unnecessary. And we're left with plus 1 squared, which is just 1. So that's what we covered in day one. Any questions on this? No questions? OK, let's move on to day two. Day two, if you guys remember, we went over imaginary numbers, right? So what happens if you try to square root a negative number? That's impossible. No two numbers can ever multiply together no two same numbers can ever multiply together to become a negative. So we gave this a label of i, i standing for imaginary number. It's not a real number because we can't comprehend it. So what did we say about this? Well, the thing you want to um, walk away from this lesson is that I, I is the square root of negative one, but I squared, I cubed, and I to the fourth. Remember this, I squared is negative one, I cubed is negative I, and I to the fourth is just one. This is very important. You wanna memorize this, or you can try solving it out, but it's very good to keep this in your head. So when can we use this? Well, when we're multiplying two binomials, for example, three minus five i to plus two i, right? This is a simple FOIL problem, but we're left with i's in this problem. But we can still sol solve it using FOIL. So let's try front, three times four is 12. Outside, three times two i is just gonna be six i. Treat i like a variable. And inside is going to be negative 5i times 4, or negative 20i. Neg and last is going to be negative 5i plus 2i, which is going to be negative 10i squared. So 12, this middle part simplifies into negative 14i. And negative 10, 10 i squared simplifies to, remember i squared is negative 1. So it simplifies to positive 10, just positive, no i. And we can simplify the whole thing to 22 minus 14 i. And we can even graph this, remember? x is the real, these are where the real numbers go, and these are where the imaginary numbers go. So 22 minus 4 i. 22 and minus 49. So minus 49 would be like somewhere here. That's how we graph it, remember? We don't, you don't really go into graphing. Graphing isn't that important. You really never do graphing actually, you never graph imaginary numbers. But yeah, that's your main takeaway for lesson two. Any questions or anything you wanna go over? from this day? Nothing? OK, let's go over day three then. Day three, we went over factoring. Factoring just greatest common factor, right? You want to find the greatest common factor and take that out so we can factor. So the main takeaway from this lesson is also the special cases. Remember, we have, let's say we have, we went over like this, e plus b squared 
or u minus v squared or u plus v and u minus v. So it's going to be one of these three cases when we factor completely. It's going to be, this is kind of like the special cases, but opposite, right? In this case, it was we used a and b, but this time we're using u and v. So it's the same thing, but we're going the opposite direction. So if we have an example, 9x squared minus 4y to the 6, and we're told we want to factor that. Well, if we want to factor this, then it's either going to be in these three forms, right? So which form is it going to be? Well, if we don't factor, but we FOIL this out, u plus v times u plus v, what does this be? u squared plus 2uv plus v squared, right? Let's try them. What is this? u squared minus 2uv plus v squared. What about the last one? It's just going to be u squared minus v squared. But we're, we're wanting to go this way for everyone. But if we look at the products of everything, what does this most go into? Well, we have two terms, right? And this one also only has two terms. So it would fit this form, right? So when we factor this, it should look something like u plus v times u minus v. So we want to look for what u is. Let's look at this equation. It says that this is u squared. 9x squared is u squared. And 4y to the 6 is going to be v squared. So can we solve for what u and v is? I think so. u and v, to get rid of this, we just square, right, on both sides, which means that u is going to be square root of 9x squared, and v is going to be square root of 4y to the 6. 9x squared squared, square root of 9x squared is going to be what? Let's see. 9, just 9. Square root of 9 is 3, right? Just 3. What about square root of x squared? Well, x times x is x squared, right? So wouldn't the square root of x squared be x, just x? Let's write 3x here, and let's try b. What's the square root of 4y to the 6? Well, square root of 4 is just 2, and the square root of y to the 6 isn't y cubed times y cubed y to the 6, right? So in this case, it's y cubed. So we found what u and v is. And all we have to do now is just plug it in in this equation. So 3x plus 2y cubed, 2y cubed and 3x plus 2y cubed. So we factored into special cases. That's going to be your main takeaway from, from this lesson. It's something really important that you need for algebra too. OK, any questions? No questions? OK, let's move on to day four. Day four, we did polynomial division, right? Dividing when we have variables. So um, let's see. If we have um, x squared minus 3x plus 9, and it's over x minus 2, and we're told to simplify this, well, if we want to simplify this, well, can we factor the top portion? No, we can't. So how can we simplify this? Well, we're just going to divide, right? A fraction, this fraction, is the same thing as divide the numerator by the denominator. So x squared, x squared minus 3x plus 9 divided by x minus 2, right? x minus 2. So if we try to divide this, 
how many we look at the highest terms of each part. So in this case, x is going to be the highest term in x minus 2. And in this case, x squared is going to be the highest term in this trinomial. So how many times does x go into x squared? Well, x times, right? Just x times. So we write it in front in the x column right here. And we multiply x times x minus 2 is going to be x squared minus 2x. We subtract, leaving negative 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 2x is going to be positive 2x, leaving negative x here. And we bring down the 9. And we ask ourselves the same thing. How many times does x go into negative x this time? Well, just negative 1 times, right? And we multiply again, negative x plus 2. Right, and we subtract. And what do we get? We get 7. This time, x doesn't go into 7, so we're left with a remainder of 7. What do we do with the remainder? Well, we add it to the answer at the end of the answer using the form remainder over divisor, right? Remainder over divisor. So x minus 1 is our answer right here. And what's our remainder? Remainder is 7. And our divisor is this number, x minus 2. So that's going to be our answer when we simplify it. We can't simplify it any more further. And this is going to be your main takeaway for this lesson. It's very important to know how to divide, um, divide when we have cases where we can't factor and simplify. Any questions on this lesson? No questions? OK. Let's move on to day five. Day five, we talked about rational exponents. So um, zeros of functions, if we have well, a graph like this, let's say graph like this, then right, how many zeros does this have? One, two, three, and four. So if we have four zeros, then our function, the graph of this function should also, our highest term should also be y equals x to the fourth, right? This is what we talked about basically. It can't be what, if it was um, y equals x to the five, and we still had four zeros, then one of the zeros would bounce, right? Remember, we talked about bouncing graphs. So, um, two. okay, let's see how many zeros are in the case. One, two, three, and four, right? But let's say this was a graph of y equal x to the five of something. We don't know, but something. But this makes sense because here it bounces. So it doesn't go through the x-axis. It just touches the x-axis and goes right back up. Whereas in other cases, it goes through. It goes through here, goes through, it goes through, right? So bouncing graphs means that it has two solutions at the same spot. That's how we depict it in a graph. So the main takeaway for this lesson is to know how to read graphs just by looking at the equation. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? If we have a graph here, let's say it looks like let's say it looks like this where this is two this is negative three this is negative one and we're given four choices what could p of x be p of x a b c or d our first option is x 
plus 3 times x minus 2 squared and x plus 1. Our second option is x plus 3 squared, x minus 2, and x plus 1. Our third option is x plus 3 squared, x minus 2 squared, and x plus 1 squared. And our last option is x plus 3 squared, x minus 2 squared, and x plus 1. So what could, which of these functions depicts this graph? Let's look at the graph. Well, we know that it bounces at negative 3. So that, that means we know that the solution of the graph, negative 3 repeats, right? So let's write down our solutions at the top. Negative 3 and negative 3. Let's see. At negative 1, it just goes through. So it doesn't bounce. We only have one solution. And we're going on. And at 2, it bounces. So we have two zeros of two. So these are our five solutions, which means that we have x to the fifth graph, right? Five solutions means x to the fifth. So let's look at this. Squared, squared, no squared. So this would be x squared, this would be x squared, this would be x. This could be right since it's x to the fifth. Let's look at this, x squared, x squared, and x squared. If we multiply this out, our highest term is going to be x to the sixth, right? So this is not going to be right. Let's look at this one. x squared. This is x squared. This is just x and this is x. Well, this would be x to the fourth, right? So this would not be right as well. This is x. This is x squared and this is x. This would also be x to the fourth. So this would not be right as well. Well, I already eliminated I already found the answer just by knowing that it's, it has to be x to the fifth, right? It's going to be d. But if we didn't know that, if we didn't know that, then we look at the bounces. So at x plus 3 squared, know that it bounces since it's a bounce, right? So we know it has to be x plus 3 squared. So we can eliminate a from that. It doesn't have x plus 3 squared. But we also know that. 2 has to bounce, so x minus 2 squared has to bounce. This one bounces, this one also bounces along with this. But this one, it does not. So we can eliminate this one. From C or D, we know that x plus 1 squared, it doesn't bounce. So we're still left with D as our final answer choice. Any questions on that one? Nothing? Okay. Let's move on to day six. Oh, we're not going to review day 10 and day 11 trigonometry because we did that recently. But if you do have time, we might do it. Okay. Let's do day six. Day six, we talked about rational exponents. So simplifying really complicated stuff, like, for example, like this. So in this case, the main takeaway, obviously, it's good to know all the laws, like, like the laws of the exponents, right? We talked about if a to the b times a, something like that, where we have the same bases. And it's going to be a and b plus c, right? So laws like that, it's good to memorize it, but the you should actually memorize it. It's very important. But the main takeaway from this lesson is knowing how to convert from radical form. So radical form, let's say that one to exponent form, like that. They are the same thing, right? This is 2. This is to the power of 1. So whatever it's the power to goes to the numerator and 2. Whatever this thing is 2 goes to the denominator. So we have another example, like y cubed the fifth. 
this is going to be what y to the b over 5th, right? This goes here, and this goes there. That's how our approach is going to be when we solve these problems. So when we look at this problem, what's our very first step? Well, we don't want to work with radicals. We want to work with fractions or exponents. So our very first step is to, just to convert. This is going to be the same thing as y times 4 times y to the 5 over 4 times half. And it's so much easier from here because using a law, 4 is just 4 to, four to the first power, right? We can multiply the radical. We can distribute the radical. So four, 1 times half is going to be 4 to the half. This is going to be 5 fourths times half is going to be 5 eighth. So we, that's a y, by the way. So we simplified it to this. 4 to the half is going to be 2, right? Because 4 to the half is the same thing as this, right? Radical 4, it's 2. And in this case, we can't simplify this. So you can leave it like that as your answer. Or you can, if you want to convert back to radical form, you can write it like that. It doesn't matter, but yeah, it's just personal preference from there. Any questions on day six? Okay, let's, let's move on to day seven. Day seven is very special. We talked about logarithms. I personally don't like logarithms. We talk about them for one lesson in math class and we never go over it again. Yeah, it comes out on the test, but yeah, I don't think it's very important. But I guess it is still pretty important. So logarithm rules are the thing you want to remember. So there are a lot, but let's go over one just. Um, for example, if we have log 12 minus log 3, if we're subtracting two logarithms, we can put them as one logarithm and divide them, right? We talked about this. So 12 to 3 is going to be log to the fourth. So we can simplify it like that. Another important rule is if we have log of a to the second power, we can bring this power out to the front. So this thing is the same thing as 2 times log a, like that if it was like that. That's a very another rule that you should also know. And another rule could be if we have log to the seventh, log base seven of three, then we can rewrite this as log of three and log of seven, right? Change of base rule. So, um, Let's try one problem. Log base 2 of 64. Log base 2 of 64. So let's, if we want to simplify this, then what's going to be our first step? Well, I think that changing this 64 into 2 of something, 2 of something. What is it? Well, 2 is it 4, 8? 2 to the 6th, yeah. 2 to the 6th is going to be 64, right? 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is the same thing as 64. So we can replace that. We, we can replace the 64 with 2 to the 6th. Log base 2 of 2 to the 6th. And from here, let's use this rule. This rule says that we can take the exponent and bring it bring it out to the front. If we do that, we're left with this. 
And another rule that we didn't we covered is that if the base and this number is the same, then it's the same thing as one. It's basically irrelevant. So our answer is just gonna be six. Any questions on logarithms? Nothing? Okay. Then let's cover day eight. Day eight. Okay, day eight we did transformations. Transformations are very important. It's it's such a huge part of algebra too. So I think if if you are gonna take away something from everything in algebra two, from everything you learned in algebra two, it's transformations. This was the most important lesson, which is shifting functions up and down, right? Or left or right, making it smaller, wider. So from this lesson, you should take away everything <laughs> because it's that important. If we have a function y equals x squared, how do we move it up and down? We multiply a number to the, I mean, we add a number to the whole thing, right? So if it's, let's rewrite this not as y equals x. Let's rewrite it like that. So if we wanna move it up, then what do we do? We do f of x, f of x plus k, plus k. That's how we move it up, right? So if we do f of x plus k, what is f of x? It's x squared. So x squared plus k. If we want to move it two units, k is going to be two. On the other hand, if we want to move it left or right, we do not f of x plus k, but we only do this, right? f of x plus k, like this multiply only the x. So what is, what does that be in this equation? It's gonna be x plus k squared. And remember, if it's a positive, it doesn't go this way, it goes this way. This is positive, and this is negative. So f of x minus k would move it to the right, right? x minus three squared. For example, what does this look like? X minus three squared. It's gonna look like a normal x squared graph, but three units to the right, right here. Three units to the right. That's what it's gonna look like. Okay, and same thing for reflections. If we want a vertical reflection, so over the x axis, like that, if you want to flip this like that, what do we do? We do multiply it to the whole thing. So negative one times f of x, or negative f of x. That's what we do. If you want to ro um, reflect it across the y-axis, so if we have like something like that, and we want it there, reflect it across the y-axis, then you do it only to the x. So it would be f of negative x. And same thing for um, shifts, not shifts, with shrinks and stretches, shrinks and stretches. So vertical shrinks and stretches. If we have a graph y equals x squared and we wanna make it stretch vertically by a factor of three like this. This is our new function. Then what do we do? We multiply the whole function, since it's vertical, right? We multiply the whole function by three. So it's three x squared. On the other hand, if we want a horizontal shrink or stretch by a factor of three, let's say, then we only do the x f of 3x, okay? So what would that be? 3x squared 
or binary squared. Okay, any questions on transformations? No questions? Okay, hopefully you guys will remember that one. And let's go over the final day, which is gonna be equations. Equations. So for this one, you wanna remember what extraneous solutions are. So fake solutions, right? Extraneous solutions. We get, we're solving the equation and we get x equals something, but that's not a real solution. That, that wasn't the actual solution. So these occur in two scenarios, right? One scenario is if we have um, a fraction over a fraction. So if we have, let's say, 2 over 2q plus 3 equals 1 over 8. So let's say we have this, and we're told to solve for q right here. This is one case where we might have an extraneous solution because we have a variable in the denominator. Another case is if we have a radical. So something like 12 minus 8w equals 6. We have a radical, and we have to get rid of it, right, to solve for w. So in this case, we can also have an extraneous solution. Let's try both examples. So how did we say we solve for this? Well, we said cross multiplication, right? Hopefully you guys remember this. 2q plus 3 times 1. Well, what is that? Just 2q plus 3. What about 2 times 8? 2 times 8 is 16. We can move 3 to the other side, leaving 13. And q is going to be 13 over 2. So is this? A correct solution. Well, let's see. Is this, if we plug it in, is it going to be an extraneous solution or not? Let's try plugging it in. We plugged it in, and what is this simplified? Is 2 cross out, giving 13 plus 3, the denominator. 13 plus 3 is 16. It's 2 over 16 equals 1 over 8. So it's correct, 2 over 16 does equal 1 over 8, right? So in this case, we didn't have an extraneous solution. Let's try this. Let's try solving for this radical. If we solve for this radical, what's our first step? We want to get rid of the radical, so we square root both sides, leaving just 12 minus 8w, right? And 6 squared is going to be 36. We can move 12 to the other side, leaving 24 and divide both sides by negative 8. So negative 3. Let's see if negative 3 is correct. So our initial equation, we plug it back in just like that. Let's see. 12 minus 8 times negative 3 is negative 24 since it's minus minus 24. It's going to be positive 24. So 12 plus 24 equals 6. And what is this? 12 plus 24 is 36. This is 6. Square root of 36 is 6. 6 equals 6. So both cases, we don't have an extraneous solution. But we always have to check like this, right? This is very important. We always have to check if we do actually have it. In both cases, we didn't, but there are going to be some cases where we do when it's in this, these two types of forms. Any questions on this? Nothing? Okay. Well, I think that's going to be it then. I hope over the past weeks that you guys learned something about Algebra 2. We didn't cover a lot of geometry, 
the geometry in this case is trigonometry. Trigonometry is part of both geometry and algebra two. But other than that, we focused mainly on algebra two. So hopefully you guys learned a lot from that. But yeah, hopefully, even though we're done with these lessons, you guys will be able to study more and master algebra two, right? That's what we truly want. I know you guys have what debates now. So if you're stressed out about that, I'm just gonna call it a day from here. And yeah, you guys can prepare for your debates if you still have to. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. See you guys.